Hi. <clears throat> okay. This is going to be rules of the road. This is going to be your introduction to rules of the road. Typically, this is the hardest part of the class that people have to deal with. Um, there's a lot of memory memorization. You're going to memorize lights, their colors, the shapes, when they're used, is used a lot of terms, sound signals. There's a lot of, lot of detail and rules of the road. The hard part, though, is passing the test where you need to get 90% to pass the test. Um, so I wish I could tell you there's a super secret to get through it. Uh, there's not. Um, but uh, I'm definitely if teaching it for as many years as I've had. Uh, there's, there's just some memory aids that I picked up on other techniques. And I'm going to try to pass those on to you. And hopefully, if you practice them, if you use them, uh, it'll definitely get you right up there to 80%, 85%. And then it's just going to be a matter of you practicing and studying to hopefully achieve that last little bit. And I'll certainly be giving you tips and things of what to study, how to study. And uh, once again, the memory aids to try to help you learn all this as much as possible. Um, some things about it, it's going to be a 50 question test um, and you need 90% to pass, of course, like I mentioned, all multiple choice. Um, when you're studying for this, we're going to give you practice exams. The practice exams are just a bunch of 30 question tests because the test used to be only 30 questions. Um, and so unfortunately for now, you're just, that's all you're going to have to practice with, but it's still, it'll be the same types of questions, same wording, same material. So it should help you out as you go through those. But, uh, the main thing is, is we found out is to just keep practicing those practice tests, keep taking them. Um, when you get questions wrong, make sure you understand why, uh, the three answers were incorrect, but only one was correct. Uh, and uh, the other thing about studying is don't try to overdo it. Don't wait until the last minute. You've got several weeks here. Use them. Start studying right away. And don't lose anything. Some people, they all just wait. I'll wait and I'll, I'll cram at the end. I can tell you right now, you're not going to pass the test by trying to cram at the end. My recommendation is you only do it an hour or two at a time. Uh, take a few tests at a time, rest, take a break, walk the dog, do something else, uh, come back, take one or two more, take another break, watch football, then take one more. Um, to really pace yourself just doing it in, in chunks where you can handle it. Because if you just try to cram and you keep taking tests after test, you'll find that after four to five tests, you start going backwards. You just start mixing up uh, questions and you start confusing some of the things. Uh, so just try to always attack it fresh, study fresh. And before you get tired, take a break, clear your mind, then come back to it in a smaller section, take a break again. And so that every time you face it, every time you study for it, you're fresh every time. It's definitely my recommendation. And uh, we'll keep, we'll keep doing reviews as often as we can to stay up with the rest of the material we have to go over. But from uh, from now on, at night, you'll study rules of the road. Weekends, days off, you're gonna study rules of the road, take practice tests in small chunks so that you know, you're just doing two hours here, then another hour, then another half hour, then another half hour, and never, never doing it for four, five, six hours plus. You're not, you're just gonna go backwards. You're gonna get frustrated. Here's another point. You're going to be studying, you're going to be practicing, and you're probably, and you're maybe not, still not passing, still not passing, and you're going to get frustrated. I just promise you this if you just stay after it, stay steady, don't overdo it, just stay steady. At some point, bing, the light clicks on, and all of a sudden you start passing tests. It, you just, just keep after it. That's all I can tell you. Just keep after it. Uh, have faith in yourself, just practice. Uh, pull out a sheet of paper maybe and write some rules down some things there and I'll and I'll give you some other little things that I recommend if you when you go in to take the test these are the things that you should be, have already memorized and 
write them right down on your scratch paper so that you have them right there. Um, so we'll do all that. And just to stay with it, um, don't get yourself down. Don't talk yourself out of right answers. This happens all the time that people will, oh, I, I thought it was this, but then I started thinking and um, don't go down that road. Don't talk yourself out of the right answer and, and try to make up things that I, well, I think they were trying to say this. No, if it's not in the question, don't read into it what's not there. All right, let's just get to it, okay? First off, I want to talk about the book itself, the Rules of the Road book. You all have them. Uh, these are yours to keep. I recommend that you highlight them, turn down pages, the corners of the pages. If you want to put tabs in them, certainly highlight and underneath, you know, the important sections, especially the ones that you have trouble finding, but you find it like, oh, you know, I keep going back to that one. I can't find it. Hey, turn the corner down, highlight it so it makes it easier to find. Definitely recommend that you do that. Get your books. And if you have to pause right now, pause it. Go get your books so that you can at least follow on this first section with me out of the book. Okay. Navigation Rules and Navigation Handbook, published by the United States Coast Guard. We open it up. we we'll start thumbing through some pages. We have a title page. We have a page with a record of changes. On the right, we see table of contents and it lists all the rules there and we have them all numbered. Don't worry, you will not have to memorize which rule is which. You won't have to remember that, hey, rule five is the lookout rule. Rule nine is the narrow channel rule. You don't have to know that. Just remember the rules themselves. Keep going back, another table of contents. And then we get to an introduction page, introduction, international rules. Let's take a look at that. International rules in this book were formalized in the Convention on the International Regulation for Preventing Collisions at Sea, 1972. They commonly call the international rules the call regs 72 or call 72 call regs. And that's call regs is for collision regulations. And that's what these are. Um, there's been changes since then, but basically um, that's what we have uh, the 72 call regs. These come from centuries of ship collisions. You know, hey, you ran into me. You should have turned right. I sh you should have turned left. You weren't watching. And going to court and, you know, companies suing, ship owners suing and, and you know, figure out, hey, we got to stop these collisions. We got to figure out what we're going to do when we see another vessel at sea at night and during the day and fog. Uh, how are we going to know how to stay out of the way of each other? And so over centuries and centuries of coming up with methods to do it, they finally settled and on, okay, this is how we are all going to do it. Everyone in the world who sails upon the waters of the world, we're all going to follow these rules. We've all agreed on it. Now we have them published and every country has their version and they're published and we're all going to follow these rules. The very last paragraph. These rules are applicable on all waters outside of the established navigation lines of demarcation. Oh, wait a minute. So it doesn't apply everywhere, only outside lines of demarcation. What does that mean? Okay. Let's go to the next page. Next page, inland rules. Oh my gosh, okay, there's another set of rules. Yeah. So this book is both international rules and in the United States, we have another set of rules. We couldn't just go along with all the international rules. We had to keep some separate rules for ourselves. And so you're going to have to learn another set of rules. The good news is most of the rules are the same. Most of the lights are the same. A lot of things are the same. So we only have to focus on the differences. Let's go ahead and read the opening line to this though. Inland rules on this book replace the old inland rules, okay. Western rivers rules, Great Lakes rules, respective pilot rules, interpretive rules, rules of the motorboat act, oh my gosh. Yeah, this, the inland rules now at least have put together lots of separate rules because the Great Lakes 
folks on the Mississippi, our Great Lakes folks had their own set of rules. The Mississippi Riverboat people had their own set of rules. Uh, then there were coastal rules, um, pilot rules. Yeah, so there were all these separate rules, even within the United States. They finally put them all together in this set of inland rules. And now they, you might hear them called the unified rules because it's unifying all of those, except it doesn't even still quite get there because there are some rules that still are unique to the Mississippi River system. And uh, one rule for lighting in particular, unique to the Great Lakes, but otherwise we have at least unified all of those rules uh, to try to make them as simple as possible. And you're just gonna have to learn the differences and I'll, and I'll certainly point those out and we'll focus on those. Okay, if we keep going on, we see a page with legal citations, uh, conversion table from conversion, converting metric to fee, what? Yeah, because they're international rules and because our inland rules have to match up to the international rules, all the measurements that we use in the rules of road are all gonna be metric. We're gonna talk about meters. 50 meter vessels, uh, less than 50 meters, 50 meters or greater. We're always gonna talk about meters. Here's a conversion table, but every time you talk about the rules, never convert. You're just gonna use, hey, this is 50, less than 50 meters or 50 meters or greater. We always just use the metric rule because that's what the rule states. And if you go to court, they're gonna follow the rule. They're not gonna try to convert it. And well, what did you think it was? No, we're following the rule, okay. Another title page, navigation rules, international inland, bold letters. Then we get to pages two and three. And if you look at pages two and three, we'll see page two, unfortunately it's backwards, so it might just be confusing, but page two uh, is titled International General Part A Rule One. If we look at page three, inland general 33 CFR rule one. That's the way the rest of this book is laid out. International rules are going to be on the left page. Inland rules are going to be on the right page. And for the most part, they will match up. So as we go through the book here, every page you flip, there'll be international on the left, inland on the right. And uh, if we look, but we're looking at pages two and three right now, we can already see just visually, these pages are not the same. So let's just look at it for an example. Application. International. These rules shall apply to all vessels upon the high seas and all waters connected therewith navigable by seagoing vessels. Okay, so let's look at inland. These rules apply to all vessels upon the inland waters of the United States and to vessels of the United States on Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. Oh, so of course they're going to be different. This rule is going to be different because it's talking about where the rule applies. Makes sense, okay? Um, so there it is, lays out international rules, as we saw earlier, outside of something called lines of demarcation. And those lines of demarcation are actual lines drawn on our navigation charts that demark or mark where you switch from international to inland rules. So as you're coming in from sea, you're observing international rules, you cross the line of demarcation, you have to remember to switch. Now I'm working on inland rules. So my sound signals are gonna be a little bit different uh, and how I might react when I see a vessel is gonna be a little bit different. And we'll talk about that uh, because fortunately they're not, the sound signals do vary uh, quite a bit, um, but um, everything else stays pretty close to the same. Further, you can read all this. There's a lot of words in there. Uh, don't get tied up. Don't get bogged down on reading everything that's in here. You need to really focus on uh, study material for the test. But I'll just briefly go some rules. Nothing in the rules shall interfere with operation of special rules by government. So governments reserve rights to uh, change some rules for some of their vessels, specifically like naval vessels, uh, research vessels, or Coast Guard vessels. They might have some different rules there, which brings me down to the tiny little footnote, which I want to point out on both of these pages. The footnote is the same on both pages, fortunately. Submarines may display as a distinctive means of identification an intermittent flashing 
amber yellow beacon with a se sequence of one flash per second for three seconds, followed by a three second off period. I don't know why, but down at the footnote here, I guess it's because it's mentioning government vessels, but this is where you find what the submarine light identification light is. So highlight that if you have a highlighter, make a note of it and remember where was the submarine light? Oh, crazy of all places, it's on pages two and three. So what that means, it's a lot of words that are kind of confusing. It's an amber yellow, a yellow light that flashes three times uh, for one second period. So it's flash, 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 and then it's off for three seconds. Flash, 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 flash. So just over and over again, three one second flashes off for three seconds and then repeats and repeats and repeats. It's supposed to signify Morse code for the letter S, submarine, dit, 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 dit. That's what it's supposed to be. So that's where that is. That's kind of an introduction to the book. Uh, as we go on, talks more about government stuff, rule one, rule one, et cetera. We get into some definitions and that's where I'll go ahead and start the PowerPoint. Um, so it'll follow roughly along in your book. So whatever you need to pause, underline, Highlight your book as you're following along with the PowerPoint. Wait for some things to get out of the way on my own. Okay, navigation rules of the road. Application, like I remember, you don't have to remember any of these rule numbers just uh, focus on what the rule itself says. Okay, rule two. Nothing in these rules shall exonerate any vessel, operator, or owner from the consequences of neglect to comply with the rules, neglect of required precautions, or any special circumstances of the case. So I mentioned centuries of law cases, people suing, going to court, etc. So these are all written by lawyers. And so, of course, no lawyer is ever going to ever write a document that somebody can come back to them later and say, hey, it's your fault. You wrote a faulty rule. You wrote a faulty document. No, you know, Lawyers, uh, you know, that's the first thing they learn in school. Never let somebody come back and blame you for anything. So they write this right in the rule. Here's rule two. Whatever happens, essentially, it's going to be your fault is almost what they're saying. Nothing will exonerate you from failure to comply with the rules, neglect to take required precautions. You're supposed to think of any precaution that could possibly be thought of by somebody. You're required to do that. You're supposed to think ahead and always be second guessing, always be what, what can happen, what can go wrong, and taking precautions. It basically comes down to you have to do whatever possible to avoid collision. You can't just go into a collision, throw your hands up and say, hey, it wasn't my fault. No, you need to take required precautions in special circumstances which may arise. These rules cannot cover every circumstance on the water. In fact, it's a big one, which is a special circumstance right off the bat is these rules only ever deal with two vessels, you and the other vessel that you're in a risk of collision with. They don't deal with any more than two vessels. So when you're out in Ock Bay, how many boats are around you? Gastineau Channel, how many boats are around you? There's always other boats around you. So you are always in a special circumstance. And so what you have is you have one circumstance with you and that boat, you have another circumstance with you and that boat, and you have to you have to always keep your head on a swivel and making your instant judgments and monitoring the situation of, hey, what's going on with that one? Okay, good, this one's passed and clear, so now I'm focusing on that one, and it's gonna be up to you. In complying with these rules, due regard shall be had to all dangers of navigation and collision. And other, not only collision, but yeah, you have to know that, hey, I've got shallow water, I've got reef over here, uh, other things that I have to keep, track of it, it's your responsible to keep track of those, including the limits of the vessels involved, their limits in their maneuverability, are they broken down, are they slow, are they towing, 
uh, which may make departure from these rules necessary to avoid immediate danger. So it will even be up to you. You're required to comply with the rules, follow the rules, but at some point you're also required to ditch the rules if that's what you have to do to avoid collision. Bottom line, you have to avoid collision, stay out of collision. Okay, let's get into some definitions. Definition of a vessel. A vessel is every description of water craft capable of being used for transportation on the water. Obviously boats, but this could be uh, seaplanes, float planes, uh, kayaks, canoes, uh, paddle boards. Now, uh, every vessel, every watercraft that can be used for transportation on the water is called a vessel. Power driven vessels are specifically vessels propelled by machinery. You know, gas engines, diesel engines, steam engines, nuclear, electric motors, electric outboards. Uh, doesn't matter if it's, a, if it's propelled by machinery, it is classified as a power driven vessel and it has to follow certain rules. Sailing vessels are vessels under sail provided any propelling machinery is not being used. What that means is the sailboat is not just a pretty boat with a mast and pretty sails. It is only a sailing vessel as defined by the rules when, is, when it is under sail and only under sail. If it, has its, if it has engines on board, it's not using the engines. If it's running its engines, it's a power-driven vessel. Even if its sails are up, it's a power-driven vessel. And this is because all these definitions have to do with maneuverability. And a sailing vessel under sail alone will have less maneuverability than a power-driven vessel. So it's gonna get privileges that a power-driven vessel doesn't have. That's why we have these definitions. Okay, the definition of underway. This is an important one for you to understand. Underway means you're at sea, of course, or on the water, not at anchor, made fast to the shore or aground in any way. In other words, you're free to drift, free to float. Underway means you are not attached to the earth. You're not attached by mooring lines, uh, anchor balls, uh, anchor chain, anything. You are not attached to the earth. You are free to float or free to maneuver. Inland waters, we already defined. Navigable waters of the US shoreward of demarcation lines. So, okay, here's two other terms that uh, we use when we're talking about two vessels where one vessel has to stay out of the way of the other. We define the names of those vessels. A give way vessel is what we call a vessel that is directed by the rules to keep out of the way of another vessel. In other words, if you're supposed to keep out of the way of a sailing vessel, you're the give way vessel. A stand on vessel is a vessel which is required by the rules to maintain its course and speed. So this one gets a little bit tricky and this is a new concept to understand. So when you have a situation where now two vessels or have risk of collision, one vessel is required to keep out of the way of the other, it's the give way vessel. But for it to keep out of the way of the other vessel, it has to be able to figure out how to do that, right? It, you got to know whether you're going to turn right, turn left, slow down, stop. And if the other vessel keeps maneuvering around and changing course and speed, you don't have a chance to figure out how to stay out of its way. So when you get into a situation where one vessel is a giveaway vessel, then the other vessel actually becomes locked in and they're required to maintain course and speed long enough for the other vessel to figure out how to stay out of the way. So a stand on vessel is required by the rules to maintain course and speed. And this kind of brings up um, the first list. Uh, and throughout these rules, I'm gonna be giving you lists and we'll practice these lists and we're gonna review these lists and repeat these lists over and over again, because they're gonna be key words in these lists and things that are gonna help you remember and how to get through questions. So first, so a stand on vessel has three requirements. So it's going to be a list of three. The first requirement, maintain course and speed. So I'm going to ask you, all right, what is a, a stand on vessel required to do? Maintain course and speed. Okay, but then there's an out. Because remember, they always set up. 
that at some point you can depart from the rules uh, to stay out of collision. This, so the second thing on our list is you may take action to avoid collision when it is apparent that the other vessel is not taking appropriate action. You may take action when it's apparent the other vessel is not taking appropriate action. <clears throat> and the key word there is may. So here's you, you're going along and here's the giveaway vessel. By the rule, which we haven't learned yet, but by the rules, they are supposed to stay out of your way. So you've seen this and you say, okay, I'm the stand on vessel. They're the giveaway vessel. I'm going to maintain course and speed and they're supposed to stay out of my way, but you're watching them, you're watching them. They're just getting closer and closer. Hey, uh, I don't know if they're awake. I don't know if they know the rules. Uh, I don't know what's going on. At some point, you're going to start getting nervous. And that's when this rule kicks into effect. The second thing here, now you've crossed my boundary. You're into my personal space. Now I am allowed, I may take action to avoid collision because I don't, I don't know what you're going to do. I am starting to have my doubts. I don't know if you're awake, paying attention. I don't know if you know what you're doing. I may take action, action at this point to avoid collision. But let's say I'm going to hang on um, a little bit longer. And that's when rule the third part of this comes into play. You shall take action. You are required to take action when the action of the giveaway vessel alone will no longer prevent collision. In other words, now they are so close that if you don't also back down hard, if you don't also throw it over, your wheel over hard to the right, if you don't take drastic action yourself, there's no way to avoid collision. At that point, the rules require you to take action. They say you shall take action when the action of the give way vessel alone will not prevent collision. At that point, you're required to. So just to kind of review the three things, a stand on vessel, stand on vessel is required to maintain course and speed. But at some point, stand on vessel may take action when the action of the give way vessel alone will not prevent collision. No, sorry. You may take action when it's apparent the other vessel is not taking appropriate action. Then the last one, third one, uh, is when you must, you shall take action when the action of the giveaway vessel alone will not prevent collision. Sorry about confusion on that one. Okay, um, skipping ahead to one of the simplest, easiest rules to remember, proper lookout. Every vessel shall at all, main, at all times maintain a proper lookout by sight and hearing. So uh, when do you maintain a proper lookout? At all times, it's that simple, that easy. The point of a lookout, the purpose of the lookout is to determine if risk of collision exists. And that's gonna be the second part of this, which we're gonna to use to develop uh, some of these other rules. But at all times you maintain a proper lookout by sight as well as hearing. Uh, when you're restricted visibility, you're listening for fog signals, or even in good visibility, you're listening for maneuvering signals. Somebody sounding uh, five short or somebody sounding one short blast, you need to, somebody needs to hear that. But the main purpose is determine if risk of collision exists. Another easy rule is every vessel shall proceed at a safe speed that can be taken proper and effective action to avoid collision. When do you maintain a, a safe speed? At all times. It's that simple. The whole purpose of the lookout and of course the safe speed is to get into a collision. If you get into a collision, part of the investigation is going to be, hey, where was your lookout? Hey, how fast were you going? And one thing you're just not going to be able to argue is, I'm, I, yeah, I was, no, I was maintaining a proper lookout. Oh, really? Well, then uh, why did you get in a collision? Didn't you see that guy? And didn't you see him early enough that you could do something about it? And by the way, why were you going so fast? No, I was only going four knots. Well, if you were going slower, you could have stopped in time. So you can kind of see the arguments here. It's up to you. See dangers early enough that you can take appropriate action and to be going at speed that you can take effective action within the distance of uh, avoiding collision. 
and it's going to be appropriate to the prevailing circumstances. Sometimes safe speed is 30 knots. Sometimes it's not even three knots. So you take all these things into account. State of visibility. Do you have good visibility? Is it nice and clear? Uh, traffic density. Uh, are you wide open or is this a busy harbor? Uh, your own vessel maneuverability. Uh, do, can you stop fast or does it take you a quarter mile to stop? Uh, uh, turning distance, how fast can you turn? If you're at night, uh, are there background lights? If you know a busy harbor next to town, you might have traffic lights, stop lights, vehicles on shore uh, that make it hard to pick out other boat lights. Uh, so you need to be careful of that. We weather conditions. Uh, your own draft in relationship to the available depth of water. You might have very few places to turn, so you need to take all of that into account. If you have operational radar, you should be using it to determine if risk of collision exists and a safe speed. Every vessel shall use all available means to determine if risk of collision exists. If there is any doubt that risk of collision exists, you shall deem that it exists and take appropriate action. Use radar, as I mentioned already. Do not make any assumptions. In other words, maybe you're following somebody and you're getting ready to overtake them and you assume, hey, you know what? I assume they're gonna turn up, they're gonna turn to the port up here. And so I'm gonna overtake them on their starboard side. No, you never make any assumptions. You sound the signal or you call them on the radio. Hey, I'm gonna overtake you on your starboard side. Is that cool? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. It's all right. Sounds good. Hey, it looks like we're all set up here, past port to port. Uh, don't assume that nothing's going to change. Do you see them? But it's a close quarter situation. Give them a call. Hey, I see you up here. How does it look port to port? Does that look okay? No, as a matter of fact, I was getting ready to uh, turn into the my slip up here. So yeah, make sure all that is figured out and you know exactly uh, what's going to happen. The best way to determine if risk of collision is by observing the approaching bearing of another vessel. So we're kind of showing in this diagram, we're talking about the relative bearing of another vessel. In other words, that's a bearing from you to them. You're watching the bearing of another vessel and that's our best way to determine if risk of collision exists. So we'll say, you know, I'm driving along, I'm going along and I look out my window, I see another boat out there. And if I made a little mark on my windscreen and I'm watching him and we're going along and I'm going along and I look up, he's still in that same mark. We're still cruising along, but he's just getting closer and closer. I know that eventually we're going to hit because as I'm watching him, that relative bearing stays the same. He's just getting closer and closer and closer. We're on a collision course that we're going to hit somewhere. Conversely, I'm watching him but I'm watching him, his bearing is changing to the right. Okay, I know he's gonna pass ahead of me. Or I'm watching him, the bearing is changing to the left. I know he's gonna pass behind me. You know, going this way. I see the bearing change to the left. I know they're gonna pass ahead of me. I see the bearing change to the right. I know they're passing behind me. Intuitively, we kind of know we're watching that, oh yeah, it looks like he's passing ahead. Oh yeah, it looks like he's passing behind. To get more specific about that, we are noticing the bearing change of another vessel. And to be the most alert mariner that we could be, we would actually mark that and watch it on a compass. Oh, yeah, I can tell we've definitely got bearing drift, right bearing drift, left bearing drift. So I'm starting to feel pretty comfortable that, yep, they're going to pass well ahead. They're going to pass uh, well behind. But if not, yep, they're just getting closer and closer. Kind of example, just getting bigger in the window. Yeah, got a collision situation, obviously. Even though his bow is pointed off in a different direction, no, we're on a collision course. But if I've got right bearing drift, yeah, he's gonna pass off to my starboard, left bearing drift, it's gonna pass off to my port, pass behind me. Even though his bow is pointed to my starboard, if I'm watching him drift off in that direction, um, you know, we've, uh, I'm gonna pass ahead of him. That's what's gonna happen. Even on radar, watching a contact on radar, you have no idea which way it's pointed, but if it's coming just closer and closer to the center of the radar, that's you in the center, it's coming towards you, you're in a collision situation. However, if that radar contact is slowly going off 
to the left, even though it's getting closer and closer, but it's passing down to your port side, then you know you're not potentially not in a situation. I always say potentially because um, depending on how close you already are or how big that vessel is, you might still be potentially in danger. So risk may exist even when you have bearing change, particularly when approaching a very large vessel or vessels at close range. Actions to avoid collision. Action to avoid collision will be made positive, ample time, and in, with regard to good seamanship. Okay, here's our second list of three things about a uh, giveaway vessel. Remember, we defined a giveaway vessel as a vessel is required to keep out of way of another. These are the three actions of a giveaway vessel. A giveaway vessel is supposed to take action that is positive. Positive means it's readily apparent to the other vessel. Remember, they were they're locked in. Uh, stand on vessels maintaining course and speed. They're locked in. They're watching you to see what you're going to do to see if you're going to take action to avoid collision. They're looking for either a major course change or a major speed change, something that's going to signify to them that, OK, yep, they saw me. They're taking the proper actions to avoid collision. So positive means readily apparent to the other vessel. A great positive action is you show them your other bow. You know, I was I was looking at their starboard bow. Now I see their port bow. That's a perfect uh, positive action. I'm feeling really good now. We're going to go port to port. Or I'm watching this big bow wake, splash, 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 and all of a sudden nothing. Okay, obviously they slowed down. You know, they were moving fast. Now they slowed down or stopped. So I'm feeling better about that. Good positive action. The second element, ample time made early enough so that you're not waiting to the last minute so that now you're invading their personal space. Now they're saying, okay, I, you're making me uncomfortable. Now I'm at that point where I am allowed to change course and speed. No, you don't wanna ever intrude into their personal space. Make your action positive, make it early. And then the last element, with due regard to good seamanship means I'm not going to speed up and pass ahead, or I'm just going to, hey, cut them 20 yards off the stern. No, I'm going to exercise good seamanship. I'm going to make a big turn. I'm going to leave plenty of sea room. I'm not going to speed up and pass ahead and embarrass them. So uh, change of course and speed is usually all that's uh, enough to avoid collision. And in lots of times, just change of course alone will be the most effective thing. Action results in a safe passing distance. If necessary, you shall slacken your speed or take all way off by stopping or reversing your means of propulsion. So there's the wording right out of the rule, but you can see what it means. It just means, hey, I gotta, I'm gonna throw it in neutral, but if necessary, I actually may have to throw it in reverse to stop or even start backing up to avoid collision. Okay, uh, that takes us up to narrow channel rules and uh, that's good enough for an introduction. Um, some review, uh, you got the definitions of vessels and so on, but hey, the simple, let me stop sharing here. Uh, the simple rules, when do you maintain a proper lookout? At all times. By sight and hearing, what's the purpose of a lookout? to determine if risk of collision exists. That's the whole purpose, the whole reason for a lookout to determine if risk of collision exists. What's the best way to determine if risk of collision exists? To observe the bearing of approaching vessels. So you're watching that bearing. And if you have constant bearing, decreasing range, risk of collision most definitely exists. But if you have right bearing drift or left bearing drift, Maybe you're, maybe you're clear, maybe things are good. They're gonna pass ahead of you. They're gonna pass astern of you. So it might be good. So you observe the approaching bearing uh, or the bearing, relative bearing of an approaching vessel to determine if risk of collision exists, either by radar or by visual. So either way, when do you maintain safe speed? At all times. And safe speed, they don't define it as a specific speed. 
but it's speed that you can take proper and effective action to avoid collision. Um, and you take all those other factors into account, visibility, uh, weather, uh, proximity to hazards, traffic density, your own maneuverability, maneuverability of other vessels. So those are all good. Okay, stand on vessel. What are the three things a stand on vessel is supposed to do? First, maintain course and speed, right? So when you're in that situation, stand on vessel, you maintain course and speed so the other vessel can figure out how to avoid you. If they're supposed to avoid you, you need to give them a chance to do that. And you can't do it if you're moving around. So you go to locked in, maintain course and speed, but you have an out. So that's the second one. You may, keyword may, change course and speed when it's apparent the other vessel is not taking appropriate action. There's your out. Now I'm uncomfortable. Now I'm going to go ahead and change course, which is another part of the rule. Don't remember if it comes up later or not, but I'll point this out. Any action that you take as a stand-on vessel to avoid collision, you, it said, the rule specifically says you shall avoid turning to port for a vessel on your port side. So anyway, they're coming, you know, they're giveaway vessel. They're supposed to stay out of your way, and, but they're all kind of ahead of you. And you think, hey, you know what? Uh, rather than have this long, long turn to starboard, if I just turn a little bit to port, then I'll just cut behind them and I'm not, I don't have to go too far out of my way. What are they supposed to do? They're actually supposed to turn to port, you know, and pass port to port and go behind you. So sure enough, as soon as you turn to port, they finally wake up, they turn to port, and now you're in one of these shopping cart situations at the grocery store, you know, where you both go this way, oh, oh, then you both go this way, and bam, right? You've done, it. You've done it before. Never, rule says avoid, I tell you never, never turn to port for a vessel on your port side. Always, always, always turn to starboard. If you turn to starboard, they have to chase you down to run into you. If you turn to starboard, you make a big circle, it's a, you know, you're out of your way, but you will, you will not get into a collision. You won't get into a collision. If you turn to port, you don't know what's going to happen. If you turn to port for a vessel on your port side, you don't know what's going to happen. You know, you're both doing this, get into a collision. Okay, let's back to our three things. Um, maintain course and speed. You may change course and speed when it's apparent the other vessel is not taking appropriate action. But then the last one is you shall, you must change course and speed when the action of the give way vessel alone will not prevent collision. They're already too close. No matter what they do now, it's too late. You also have to pull back. You've got to reverse your engines. You've got to throw the wheel hard over. You know, that's the only way at that point you are required by the rules to take action. You shall. But there's another term for that. They call it en extremis, Latin term. En extremis, you're in extreme danger. Uh, that's the point you're in. You have to back down hard. You have to throw your wheel out over to avoid collision. So there's our introduction to rules of the road. Uh, simple rules so far, some simple definitions, but it's going to get us started. Uh, then we can carry on with the rest of it.